responsibility of the Hermes project to develop, fabricate, and test a series of surface-to-surface -surface tactical missiles and to carry out what research and design is essential to fulfill the primary task consistent with sound development. To translate this assignment into current results, here's the project engineer in charge. First, I would like to introduce the principal character in this review of the Hermes guided missile program, the Hermes A-1. The A-1 is our first test vehicle. Six of its kind have been built and launched at the White Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico, the last on April 26, 1951. Slightly less than 26 feet long and 3 feet in diameter, the A-1 has a takeoff weight of approximately 6,600 pounds. For test purposes, the warhead in the nose is replaced by instruments and ballast. The guidance system is simple. The propellant is the familiar combination of alcohol as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer, and the range is about 40 miles. Although it was originally conceived as a trial horse for the eventual design of anti-aircraft missiles, the chief value of the Hermes A-1 has been as an experimental prototype for the research and development of tactically useful surface-to-surface -surface missiles. What then will be the features of these A-1-type tactical missiles? And what is the pattern of operation? First of all, the propulsion system is inherently simple and rugged. Instead of complicated pumping and controls such as the V-2 has, the Hermes design uses pressurized helium gas and a simple valving system to feed the propellant into the combustion chamber of the motor. The resultant thrust is 19,000 pounds at sea level. Secondly, the guidance system is the tracking command type in which a modified SCR 584 radar, the same one that performed so well in World War II, automatically tracks a beacon in the nose of the missile. It then transmits proportional commands back over its beam to correct the gyro system during flight. A very important operational advantage of the Hermes guidance is that the transmission from ground radar to the missile is coded to prevent jamming by the enemy. And thirdly, the flight control system is a gyro-controlled electro-hydraulic method of operating the four jet vanes and the four aerodynamic control surfaces at the tail of the missile. Having both high speed of response and the ability to function over a wide range of velocities and altitudes, this automatic pilot controls and corrects the pitch angle of the trajectory and also prevents unnecessary roll and yaw of the missile. Since the command guidance system corrects errors in the missile flight path until late in the trajectory, the flight control gyros do not have to be extremely accurate, thus permitting the use of simple and rugged equipment. Here's the pattern of tactical performance planned for an A-1 missile. The essential elements of ground control are a launching desk to fire the missile and the radar command guidance set. The missile itself is positioned at the launching site so that the two fins carrying the yaw control surfaces are in a vertical plane with the target. When the firing switch is thrown, the missile takes off vertically from a small launching platform. No booster is used. Five seconds later, an internal preset programming cam operates to depress the two pitch control surfaces, thus pitching the missile forward toward the target in what is approximately a ballistic trajectory. Although the radar is continuously tracking the missile, no ground commands are being sent and any roll or deviations in azimuth are corrected by the missile's own flight control system. About three quarters of a minute later, when the radar has determined that the correct velocity has been reached, a signal is transmitted over the command channels to cut off the propulsion. A few seconds later, the ground command guidance system takes over azimuth control. 
the missile is still climbing at upwards of 1,800 miles an hour. From here on until the last few seconds of the terminal dive, deviations in the radar to target vertical plane, such as those caused by crosswinds and gyro drift, are automatically monitored and corrected by coded commands from the radar to the missile's flight control. Pitch control, on the other hand, is maintained by the missile's preset cam programming until the trajectory peak of about 80,000 feet has been reached. Then the cam shuts itself off, putting the missile into a mushing glide. As the missile begins to approach the target at a slant range preset in the ground command set, a radio signal is set up to restart the pitch program. The cam depresses the pitch rudders to maximum, throwing the missile into a steep dive over the target. Now the command guidance system comes into full operation. The ground radar, in which a reference range has been accurately preset, measures the difference between the actual missile position and the preset range. The difference is transmitted to the missile as an error signal, which operates the pitch rudders to correct the path. This action reduces the error towards zero and brings the missile in on the final approach. Radar contact will soon be lost because of the ground contours. However, the missile is now traveling almost straight down toward the target, and the internal gyro control holds it on course. Approximately 170 seconds after takeoff, impact occurs at supersonic velocity, with a destructive power equal to several batteries of 155. Now let's go down to the White Sands Proving Ground and follow the actual pre-flight and launching procedures of the last A-1 test vehicle, starting with a preliminary checkout. It must be borne in mind that the following procedures are geared to laboratory requirements for testing and measuring the development work. Actual tactical procedures will be much less involved. After the vehicle has been checked over and repainted, it is picked up by the crane, transferred to a wooden cradle, and then weighed. This data is used in determining the center of gravity. When these preparations are over, the vehicle is loaded on a truck and hauled seven miles east to the launching site. The problem of field handling is definitely simplified by the A1's structural combination of extreme strength and relatively small size. No elaborate precautions have to be taken. The vehicle is next mounted on its launching platform by the gantry crane. And transit readings are made to ensure perpendicular alignment. Each man on the field crew works according to a planned assignment and the A-1 is prepared for flight. The guidance beacon in the nose is checked. The servo amplifiers and the gyros are put into readiness. Control circuits are tested for proper operation of the control surfaces and vanes. The propulsion system valve squibs and the motor igniters are prepared. Everything is carefully gone over. System tests are run off in collaboration both with the radar ground command set at station C and the telemetry and launching desk controls in the blockhouse. As the time of firing approaches, the preparations move swiftly according to a strict schedule. Alcohol is pumped into the tank of the missile. The liquid oxygen truck is brought into the area and connections are set up for filling. The igniters that first fire the motor are mounted on the launching platform so that they extend into the combustion chamber of the motor. The squibs that open the valves in the various propulsion feed lines are also installed and connected. It is soon time to put on the doors and fasten them shut. 
The main attention is now centered at the control panel in the blockhouse, from which the project officer in charge of the launching coordinates all of the facilities and activities. The yellow lights at the bottom indicate that the network of recording and observation stations, such as this huge tracking telescope on top of Mule Peak, is manned and in readiness. For perfect correlation, all of the operating equipment is electrically synchronized from the blockhouse by this Aberdeen time signal panel. Meanwhile, a final weather check has been made. The gantry is being moved away from the missile. And at X minus 15 minutes, a red smoke signal is sent up as a safety precaution to clear the area. At X minus 10 minutes, the two operators at the launching control desk next to the project officer initiate the final sequence of operations. The key switch is turned to the fire position. The main switch is moved to position one thus applying external electrical power to the missile. And a final checkout is made of the entire system and all correlating ground equipment. During this period, the missile's liquid oxygen tank is automatically kept full to overflowing or topped by a remotely controlled pumping equipment known as the LOX topping buggy. This is a final precaution to replace the small amount that inevitably boils off in the short time since the tank was first filled. At approximately X minus two minutes, when all of the components have been tested and put into operating readiness, a red star shell is fired as a warning signal. The blockhouse is next notified that the helium sphere in the vehicle has been fully pressurized to 5,700 pounds per square inch. Now, as we approach X minus 30 seconds, everything is set for the firing. The blockhouse has been closed up and the stations are all manned. As the seconds tick away, attention is focused on the project officer. Coming up on X minus three zero seconds. X minus three zero, mark. Electrical control except for the ignition firing circuits is transferred from the blockhouse to the A1's own internal battery system. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, A, B, C, missile away! <laughs> On the range, the flight is being tracked and recorded from the many observation stations. As an approximate indication only, burnout is called in over the telephone network and the timing clock is manually stopped. The radar command guidance set is in perfect synchronism as it monitors the missile and maintains the planned trajectory. Back in the blockhouse, dozens of instruments are busily recording all of the performance data right up to the moment of impact. The approximate location of the impact is quickly plotted on a map from the reports of the various observation stations out on the range who call in their findings. In spite of the tremendous force of the impact, the battered sections of the A-1 are examined by members of the recovery party and found to be in fair shape for later laboratory examination. But the real significance of the wreckage spread out here on the desert, the wreckage of a test vehicle that took seven hours to prepare for launching and whose insides were crammed full of instruments and vacuum tubes is that it marked a turning point in the project. These twisted remains are actually a final monument to the many long months of tireless research and development that will make it possible to provide the Army with effective weapons for use against masses of personnel.
in these as in all of the activities toward the development of surface to surface guided missiles the twin objectives of reliability and simplicity are continually stressed so that the armed forces shall have tactical weapons of high performance this is the goal to which project hermes is dedicated